Hi, it's Robin. We haven't talked about my favorite 10 print programs since last year, so I think it's about time to take another look at it. I'm talking about this one-line basic program that I find so interesting. When you run it, you get a maze. So optimization is always interesting. One thing we can do is if we just get rid of line 10 and instead change it to line zero, and of course get rid of the spaces, change the one to a dot, and get rid of the line number altogether, taking advantage of a quirk that go to defaults to line zero. List the program again. As far as I know, that's the shortest version of 10 print around that you can write in basic. And it runs a little bit faster than the normal 10 print. So if that's as short as a basic version of 10 print can get, how about machine language? Well, viewer Peter Lind contacted me about trying to write 10 print in machine language, and we traded ideas and code back and forth. So let's take a look at those ideas today. In the video description, I'll have a link to download my work disk from this episode. It includes a copy of Turbo Macro Pro here. Or if you happen to have a RAM expansion unit, that version's include on the disk as well, but that's not necessary today. And once you've loaded Turbo Macro Pro, comma eight, comma one, which I've already done, you can start it with sys three two seven six eight, and we're in the Turbo Macro Pro editor where we can edit assembly language on the C sixty four. Back arrow L allows you to load a file. ML1 is the first version of a machine language 10 print that I tried. And here's the code. It's fairly short. We'll walk through it. We're going to be assembling to location 828, which is the cassette buffer. And it's just a handy place for very small machine language routines. Here I've put the basic code for 10 print, just in case you don't have it memorized yet. So we're going to implement this in machine language. Uh, I don't really know why I put it in the middle here. <laughs> so maybe the trickiest part about implementing 10 print is that it uses this random function, which returns a value between zero and one. And what happens is character 205 is one of the slash characters that makes up the wall and adjacent to it is character 206, which is a slash the other direction or a diagonal the other direction. So 205.5, and adding a number, a float number between zero and one, and then the character string function effectively truncates that. So you end up either printing character 205 or 206 about 50% of the time each. Where do we get a random zero or one? Well, the most obvious source in the Commerce 64 is the SID chip, the sound interface device, which is part of its noise waveform, its white noise waveform, generates a sequence of random numbers, a 23-bit linear feedback shift register. It's not truly random, of course, but it'll do. However, there is a bit of setup that we need to do to start the SID generating those random numbers. First, we store an FF, that's the maximum 8-bit number, in the SID oscillator three frequency registers, the low and high bytes, it's a 16 bit register spread across two eight bit registers. And by putting FF in both of those, we're saying the frequency to the maximum, making the SID output these round numbers, changing them as quickly as possible. And it turns out that's about every 16 or 17 machine cycles. It runs at about one megahertz, one million cycles per second. Every 16 or 17 of these cycles, that value will change. This matters because if we're trying to read that register very quickly, it might return repeating numbers. But for our purposes today, this is fast enough. And the one other thing we need to do to initialize the SID is set the high bit of this control register to enable the noise waveform. And the remainder of the code is a loop 
that more or less replicates the basic code. This initialization is a one-time thing that really has no analog in the basic code. Now that the SID is set up, here's an endless loop where we're going to load from the oscillator three output. Most of the SID is write only, but does have some registers that can be read. And one of them is the oscillator three output. This is basically getting an eight bit random value. Now, what do we do with that? Well, if we use the rotate right command, it will rotate that random number one bit to the right and the low bit will fall off into the carry. So we've either got a zero or a one in the carry. Now we can load the accumulator with character 205, just like in the basic code here. And we can add with carry zero. So we're adding zero, but it's also adding whatever is in carry, which is either zero or one. And we end up with either a 205 or 206 in the accumulator, then we can jump to the FFD2 kernel routine, which is called character out, CHR out, which prints a single character. And now our random diagonal has been printed on the screen and we can just jump back to loop and do this endlessly. Okay, so that's a very straightforward implementation. Let's see it. We'll back arrow three to assemble. Back arrow one to drop out to basic. Just increase the contrast. I'll hit control two, which changes the cursor color to white before I start the code. Of course, that's not strictly necessary, but it's for you, my viewers. I hope I remember every time. And to start the code, we can call the basic command sys, which starts a machine language program. And we told it to assemble to location 828. So that's the parameter. Here we go. And there's 10 print. And you'll see it's running an awful lot faster than the basic version. We can hold down the control key, which slows down that character out routine. Every time it prints a new line, you can see how it almost instantly prints 80 characters and then it jumps up, making room for more printing. You can see it looks pretty random. That's a pretty good maze. Okay, hold down stop and tap restore to get out of the program and sys32768 to go back into Turbo Macro Pro ready to edit. So there you go, a machine language version. Of course, that's not enough for one episode, is it? Let's optimize this a bit. We can choose, are we going to optimize for speed or are we going to optimize for size? Well, it's already pretty fast, and really it's calling this print character routine that is using the vast majority of the cycles in this program. So to significantly speed this program up, really we'd have to rewrite the print character routine, and that just doesn't sound that fun to me. So I want to optimize for size today. Can we make this shorter? So we can save three bytes by eliminating this store to the low byte of the SID frequency register. The high byte is 256 times more significant. So this barely makes a difference. It matters for music when you want to fine tune the SID to a particular note. But as far as outputting numbers quickly, it barely makes a difference. And for our purposes, we can just get rid of that. So back arrow and delete, we'll get rid of that line. Now the rotate right, that takes one byte. Load A205 takes two more and add carry takes two more. So that's a total of five bytes. I'm not completely happy with doing this add carry zero. That seems kind of like a waste. So instead what we can do to get a random number between zero and one is and the accumulator with one. Now just leave the low bit, either zero or one. And we can add with carry 205. So here we're going to have either 205 or 206. And we can just get rid of this add carry zero. So now we've got four bytes instead of five. And this jump loop takes three bytes for an absolute jump. Instead, branching only takes two. So 
if we branch if carry clear to loop, that will save one more byte. So that saved five bytes from 26 down to 21. Does it still work? Let's try it. Here we go. Yeah, it looks pretty good. You might be thinking, I've cheated a bit here. Aren't I ignoring carry here? And how about down here? Why am I branching if carry clear? What if carry is set? Well, as part of the sys command, carry is cleared. So we know that carry is still going to be clear for this first add. But how about when we print the character? Maybe that routine might set or clear carry. We're essentially treating this branch as carry clear as a branch always because we're assuming carry will be clear. But is that true? Well, it is. If I jump into the super snapshot, into the monitor, and we disassemble part of the kernel, E6A8, and this is the code that's called when character out, FFD2, is exiting. And you can see what it does is restores the Y, the X, the A registers, and it does two more things. It clears carry. So we know that whenever you print a character, carry will always be clear afterwards. And really strangely, it also clears the interrupt disable. That's actually bit me before because I know I've written interrupt code before where I've tried to print a character <laughs> during the interrupt code, which I guess isn't really a good idea. Well, it's definitely not a good idea because FFD2 actually clears interrupt disable and will re-enable interrupts even before you're ready for it. So I actually don't know why it does that. If you do, leave a comment. So anyway, the important thing here is that carry is clear when exiting from FFD2. So that's on the work disk is file ML2, down to 21 bytes. Now the loop is starting to get very tight here, but what seems probably wasteful is all this initialization code. That's like 10 bytes there. If we could find a different source of randomness than the SID, then maybe we could get rid of this initialization code. Okay, so we'll load up file ML3. And as you see, this is quite a bit shorter, 13 bytes. So what are we doing for randomness here? Every time through the loop, I'm incrementing the X register, which fortunately FFD2 does preserve, and loading a byte from the kernel ROM F002 indexed by X, as the value of X is added to it. So I put random in quotes because this is very, very not random. It's just a 256 byte sequence of numbers. And then we just do the same thing where we just take the low bit of the ROM value, add 205, call FFD2, and use the same carry clear tricks that we did from last time. So I want to emphasize these are not at all good sources of random values or, you know, not even really random at all. Okay, but we're not doing encryption here. This isn't banking software. This is just a goofy maze on our old computers. So let's see if it works. We'll assemble it. Back arrow one to quit to basic and call 828. Okay. Looks pretty random to me. Okay, there is a repeating pattern here. And maybe you can pick it out. But when I look at that, that looks pretty good. So if we go back into the monitor, and if we look at the memory at F002, There it is. That might even seem random, but actually some of it 
is these error messages. And the part before that, this is some of the RS-232 input-output routines. Just re-enable my keyboard shortcuts here. I don't know why Turbo Macro Pro disables them, but it does. So how did I come up with that F002? I wrote this little ROM scan program that just goes through the kernel ROM. This is from E1000 hex to near the end of the ROM. And basically it examines 256 bytes at a time and does a count of the low bits in each 256 byte range and sums them up. And if the low bits of any particular 256 byte range is 128, then that per ROM is 50, 50 zeros and ones. And I thought, well, that's random, isn't it? <laughs> no, of course it's not, but it just means that we'll have a nice even distribution of zeros and ones for our maze to look fairly random. So this little scan program's on the work disk. If you want to play around with it, be warned, it is slow. If you have a super CPU or some other accelerator or warp mode in Vice, you might want to use that. Actually, I'll just change this to start scanning at F1000, F000, just so you can see. And so all it's doing is reporting back at what memory locations are there 128 out of 256 with the low bit clear or set. So there's lots of choices. I chose F002 because it was the one closest to the beginning of a page, as the beginning of a page would be 00, and this is at just two bytes after it. So when doing the indexing, it'll cross the page into F100, only three out of 256 times crossing a page costs one extra cycle for the load A. Here for the absolute X, there's a star. It normally takes four cycles, but the star means that you have to add one if the page boundary is crossed. So I am optimizing for size primarily, but when given the choice, my secondary objective is to optimize for speed and this was the best I could find. Unfortunately, I couldn't find any 50-50 range that started at the beginning of a page with the low bytes, zero, zero. Okay, so that's 13 bytes. Can we do better? If there was a source of randomness that didn't require incrementing this index, then we could save a byte. So that's what I did in ML4. Another register that changes frequently is the raster register. As the video screen is drawn, it keeps track of what scan line from 0 to 255 plus a high bit is in register DO11 for the ninth bit. So this is changing every 63 to 65 cycles, depending on VIC revision, PAL, and TSC. This is getting updated. So we can just load it in and again, and it, add with carry, just the same as before. And this has the advantage of being just 12 bytes instead of the previous 13. We'll assemble it. Okay. But I do find that the randomness of this is worse. Like even while it's scrolling by, it's not as random a maze. All those kind of long corridors of wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. You see what I'm talking about there? They're kind of still pleasing shapes, but I think less random. And I think the reason for that is that this FFD2 takes somewhere in the neighborhood of 250, 300 cycles to print a character. 
but the raster register is so predictable. Say on NTSC, for 65 cycles, it'll be an odd number. Then for 65 cycles, it'll be even, then odd, then even. Printing a character takes a fairly steady amount of cycles. So there's just going to be a lot of predictability that when we're reading this register in, there's going to be a pattern there. It is not just like left, right, left, right. It's not just zero, one, zero, one. But overall, there's more repetition or you can detect a pattern. The one thing that throws more randomness in is when the screen scrolls. That takes a lot more cycles, but it's all still fairly deterministic. This works, but it's probably the worst looking randomness we've had so far. So can we do better? So we'll, we'll load in ML5, and instead of the raster interrupt, we're going to be reading from the CIA timer A, low byte. This is the timer that's continually running until you tell it to stop to service the system interrupt. And every machine cycle, it changes. So even though that's very regular, it's odd, even, odd, even, it seems much less likely that we see a pattern out of it when you add in the variability of the kernel print routine and the system interrupt happening. I've also switched back to the rotate version where what this is doing is taking the low bit of the CIA timer that just keeps counting down, pushing off the low bit into the carry, and then loading in 205, adding zero with carry. So again, we get the 205, 206, just the same as we saw before. So if we try that, there we go. And I think that looks more random than the raster version. Feel free to share your opinions. Of course, when I pause it, that changes when the values are being read for the new oncoming scroll, the oncoming maze. But the part above should be the same. Oh, that, this one seems to make more of those closed squares or diamonds. Okay, so this is the best that Peter and I came up with. In all cases, we have to use three bytes to get our random value because we're always loading or rotating from a 16-bit address. So it's one byte for the opcode and then two bytes for the address. If there was a zero page location with a random value in it, then that would save a byte. Unfortunately, the only thing that's in zero page that's kind of automatically changing is the time of day timer, but that's just counting jiffies, 60ths of a second. So that goes for like, what, 1600 cycles before it changes and all it does is go up by one. So that is not a good source of randomness at all. Like it doesn't even look random, never mind it not being random. Okay, but there is an honorable mention here. So if any of you are puzzling over this, I do want to show you one idea that we had that unfortunately didn't work just due to unluckiness. So instead of 205, if we were to divide that in half, say 102, then instead of adding, we could rotate left. So we're pushing our random bit into the carry. Then we're loading the accumulator with the character we want divided by two. And then we're going to rotate it left, multiply it by two, which would pull that carry bit into the register and it would become the low bit. And we would end up with 102 times two is 204, or if the carry was set, 205. And this would save a byte because any of these opcodes that operate just on the accumulator just use one byte instead of two. There is no actual operand byte, even though some 6502 assemblers put this little A here. I don't really like it, but it is part of the official machine language for the 6502. So this would be 11 bytes. Let's try it. 
but it doesn't work because it is showing character 204 or 205 instead of 205 or 206. So we get this ugliness instead, which honestly does look even less random when you look at it that way. So basically it comes down to the bad luck that 205, 205 and 206, if it had been an even number followed by an odd number for these two slashes, then this technique would work and we could have an 11 byte solution. So that's our best version. Can you do it in less? Do you have any ideas? It feels like there might be one more trick here where we can get this slightly smaller, but we're still pretty happy with a 12 byte solution. Thanks again to Peter for prompting this idea. Thanks to my patrons for their support. Thank you for watching, and we'll talk to you next time. On this